Hello, everyone. My name is Garrett Manyoki. I am the head honcho of main man behind curator of the solo project Blackboard. And I'm going to be providing a commentary on my very first album, Sounds and Words. I figured this would be an interesting thing to do to provide a little bit more insight onto how the album was made, how every song was conceived and all that. And just so that way, you know, once you've heard the album, you can get a little bit more of like a behind the scenes thing as to just how this whole thing came together. You know, my story behind every track here and just how it just all, you know, came through and why it exists in the first place. So just a little bit of background, um, on the album itself. So it's a collection of songs that were some of the first that I had ever written from the period around June, 2014 to about August, 2015. I had started to write some of these ideas on piano first, but then I picked up guitar about July, 2014. And I eventually started writing more of my uh, chord progressions and such on guitar. So most of these songs were written on guitar. Uh, you can kind of tell as they are a bit more guitar driven. Uh, and it wasn't like a continuous period of writing. I had, uh, I think the writing of this was very slow. I just kind of, a lot of these songs I just kind of came up with like a chord progression that I really liked. And I just, the rest of the song just kind of, you know, wrote itself after that, just kind of expanded on that one progression that I really liked, and that's just kind of really how every song was made, at least musically. Uh, it wasn't like a constant, you know, period of writing. I think all the ideas, like I said, just came really slowly, and there was a long point where I hadn't written anything until one final song um, was written uh, overall, so that's why I extend the period from you know, like, say, March or April 2015, when I probably had written the last idea until August when I came up with that one last idea. So, overall, the writing took, you know, from the first idea to the last about a year, and then after that, I dealt with all the lyrics and stuff. So, the reason why this album even, even exists in the first place is I had never thought about doing, like, a solo project before until I was with a friend of mine at a party, a friend of mine who was on this album... And he mentioned that he wanted to do a solo project of his own, of just taking his ideas that were separate from the band that we were in and just kind of, you know, putting uh, putting them towards like a solo project, a solo band type of thing. And I got the idea going in my head of wanting to take my own songs that I was going to use for the band, maybe like, you know, one song on the album or two songs on whatever album that, you know, was written by me. Uh, they wouldn't go to there. They would go towards my solo project they would go towards my own thing so that's how this was created in the first place uh once i got home from that party i took all my ideas and i just put a track list of them together and that's how sounds and words was created now it wasn't always going to be the final version that is released to the world now the the one that's released now to the world is an 11 track album that runs at about 53 minutes it was originally going to be a 17-track album, one that ran extremely long and probably would have been about 75 minutes, which is not a concept that I'm against, a 17-track, 75-minute album. I don't mind an album being that very long, but some of the ideas that, you know, the six songs that I ended up cutting, they would have been filler songs. I didn't feel as strongly towards them as I guess I had hoped uh all the years that I had had them in my head and I had had them planned, uh, you know, to be on the album, but that just kind of happens after years of not really doing much with them. You just kind of find less of a passion for them, I guess. Uh, this was originally going to be a bit more organic sounding, I guess you could say. I was going to record it all at uh, another friend's house who is on this album multiple times. Um... I was going to have the entire thing recorded there, but the main thing with that is he goes to college at York College of Pennsylvania, like two hours away from his house, so he was really only available during breaks, and not that I have, you know, a issue with that at all, it's just that not a lot of progress was ended up um, being made 
because of just the the time, which you know that that just kind of happens. Uh, I guess I'm in a sense thankful that that's kind of the the way it went because if if this was released in like 2016 or so with the original track list, I would have ended up liking this project less because I thought it would have been just a bit too bloated. Like I said, the six songs just didn't have enough staying power. Um, so that's why it uh, existed the 11 tracks it does because I cut it down, reworked the track, thing, track listing a little bit, and I actually made this my senior capstone. I uh, recently graduated college at Rowdy University with a uh, degree, a Bachelor of Arts in Popular Music Studies. So I made this my capstone for that. My final project is finishing the album, which didn't have too much recorded at that point. It was obviously already, uh, already written. Every single lyric was written. Every single idea was created in terms of the music, but I did rework some of the lyrics because some of the old lyrics just kind of sucked, honestly. Um, so that's kind of just like what, uh, what I did is I, you know, reworked the album that I had and I think made it a stronger project. Uh, I originally had real drum tracks that I didn't end up using because it would have been a bitch to deal with those drum tracks, just mixing them and all that. There was some stuff that I wanted to change that I didn't want to like lug my drum set into the studio again and just record them. So, you know, that, that would have just taken up too much time. So I used program drums because I could have gotten, you know, the the bit more preferred sounds with them, I think at least. And uh, the fact that I wanted to use a skill that I had learned in college, something I learned how to do in college, I wanted to use that for my final college project. So just like, you know, having all of this uh, just kind of come, you know, this way, um, that's... That's really the reason why it exists now, because I chose to put myself on a time crunch and just get this damn thing out because it had been in my head for so long that I just I just wanted it out. I just wanted it to be a thing, but I wanted to feel proud of my final product, and I can gladly say that I do feel proud of the final product. It may not be a flawless, you know, sounding album, a flawless, you know, like an album of flawless takes or anything like that, but I am extremely proud of how the final thing, uh, came out. So, um, not going to go too much longer with this, like, you know, preamble kind of thing, but I do want to, uh, thank everybody who has heard the album at this point. Um, and hopefully this might be a thing that could make people like want to, you know, listen to it more just to, you know, see what I have to say about it. Um, this is not really like I, I I say that this is like a solo project of mine, but it's not really like a solo album. I don't think any of the future endeavors I do will really be a solo album unless it's like something instrumental because I am not a vocalist at all. I cannot sing very well at all, so I had to have other people come in and sing. I'm not the best guitarist in the world, so like all the lead guitar was dealt by other people. Bass was dealt by other people. So there's a lot of people who helped me with this project. Uh, there are a total of 13 musicians on it, including myself. So I want to shout out um, everybody who is on the album. And I'll go by alphabetic by last name. Steven Evans, Kylan Hillman, Tristan Inman, Garrett Cruz, Tucker Lugosi, Zach Moranowick, Tiffany Reynolds, Catherine Rommel, Elizabeth Rommel, uh, Nick Thompson, Aaron Marquis Watson, and Andrew Wojak. Those are all the people who were, appear on the album, and also uh, my mother, Lisa, did the artwork for it. So, a bunch of people who came together to help me with this project. Thankfully, um, it turned out to be as uh, diverse in cast and diverse in genres. I think this is a very diverse album overall. You can kind of... Uh, you'll, you'll be able to kind of... Uh, understand a bit of my uh you know feeling towards that once I start diving into all the songs so I don't really think I have much else to say um other than that so I think what I'm gonna start doing now is just playing through the album and I will give my uh you know just kind of uh my stories as to how all these songs were created so without further ado let's just uh start it out we're going to start out with the first track, Let My Spirit Out, and we're just going to, you know, play the album through. I'm not going to pause at all, just going to, you know, let it run through, and I will give my, uh, 
my commentary. So here we go. So this track right here, I, when I was creating the track list for the album, I pretty much always imagined this one as the opener because I like how it starts off with its, uh, you know, arpeggio where it's just the B and E strings um, in succession, and then it kind of kicks in with the main chord progression. You have all these instruments in there, and the fact that you're getting these uh, like really luscious harmonies less than a minute into the track. It's just a very good opener, a good way to draw people into the uh, to the album, you know, just a very good uh, setup kind of for what's going to go on. Um, I think of this as like the most jangly of all the songs on the album. It has a very, very bright tone to it. Um, my capstone advisor who, you know, uh, I, I picked for, you know, the capstone overall, he described it as very uplifting and... It was kind of a nice compliment, I think, because it was a very, um, it's a very good way to start off an album, something that's just very uplifting in tone. It doesn't make you want to turn away right away. It's just, it's very happy sounding. It's a bit epic, kind of anthemic and all. So I think that was a, a really nice thing to notice that the song was very, um, very uplifting in tone. And musically, you know, you can definitely see that with uh, just the way that everything is kind of arranged, how it, like I said, it's very layered, very jangly in tone because I do have a soft spot for like jangle pop, so I think this um, was definitely a very uh, uh, the song right here like has, has a bit of a soft spot for me uh, so on this track, um, in terms of just like, you know, the people who are on it, uh, so I'm taking care of the program drums here Doing most of the guitar, except for my buddy Zach Moranowick, who uh, takes to care of the lead guitar. The bass is taken care of by Steven Evans, and uh, Nick Thompson is doing the vocals on it. So, um, I consider everybody who's on the album to be just as important, even though it's not their album, it's not their project, but they're responsible for emoting and taking care of, you know, these different parts. Uh, so I really want people to understand just how important they are to the project. It's not just me here, it's so many other people as well. Um, and I think part of the uh, reason why this could maybe get described as uplifting is not just because of the way that the music sounds, but also because of the lyrical content. This song in particular is... Um, what I tried to do with the lyrics on this album is I tried to make them a bit, uh, you know, diverse in topic, so... I wanted to tackle different ideas, which I found pretty difficult since these were like some of the first songs, I think actually pretty much the first songs I wrote like lyrics for. So this one in particular is about a kid, uh, you know, didn't specify an age, but he could be like a high school kid or so, basically overcoming shyness. I described the scenario of this kid who over summer break is finding his own confidence in himself and, um, you know, just realizing that socializing is a very positive thing, especially when you're around people who enjoy it just as much as you do and who like your company and all. So just kind of like, a, you know, once the school year begins again, he's just overcoming that shyness and he's going to become a more social person, just become a more positive, I, I, I don't know, I wouldn't say more positive person, not to say he wasn't positive already, but he's just kind of becoming a different person as a result of realizing that you can't, you know, like, like shyness is something that's not to be demonized, but it can be a very difficult thing to live with. Um, I don't consider a lot of this album to be based off of personal experiences, but I was, I was a pretty shy person growing up. I still think I kind of am to a degree. Sometimes it is difficult to start up conversations to feel the, you know, need to in a degree I guess um, but I think you know once I started to find myself in high school and like find my personality and my tastes and all then I think it just kind of became better about the whole shy thing um, so that's what this song is about it does uh, have a bit more of a serious tone to it given its uh, lyrical content um, 
and overall, I just think it's a very good, uh, very interesting opening track. One that I think perfectly sets up the rest of this album and what it's going to kind of do. Even though there's, you know, it's not like every song is like this. It's just kind of a good opening moment. Mean Time isn't one that I have a lot to say about since it's super short. I just came up with a chord progression and I did not know what to do with it after that, so I just kept it. And originally it was supposed to be an acoustic piece that Zach recorded, um, th that I had him record, you know, a while back. Um, but then I decided to change the key of the song, so that had to get scrapped. And then I tried to have him do like a clean electric guitar thing, it's what's working out. So then I decided to make it classical like chamber music that kind of thing and so it kind of exists as just like this super short interlude and that's really it nothing more to it um I had it described as like very lullaby like which is pretty interesting and that transitions directly into the lead single for this album i released this as a single the day before the album's release that being music ain't dying so let's all come near and sing our hearts away um, a pretty interesting song to have as a lead single, considering the fact that it is six and a half minutes. So that's not really something that you would expect to have as a lead single. But I do think this is a very good introduction to what the album is going to kind of provide. This song overall has more of a folk rock vibe, has a very strong accented rhythm to it and all. Very much driven by the acoustic guitar. Uh, I liked that kind of vibe to it overall because I think you know folk rock is a genre that can sound pretty relatable so I wanted to have that be the first moment that people heard from the album and it's just kind of just kind of a uh, you know rang true as like a single to me and this is actually where the uh, title of the album comes from sounds and words it comes in the chorus of the song um, I tested out multiple different lyrics from the album that I wanted to use as a title, and Sounds of Words is the one that's, uh, that stuck out to me the most. Um, it was actually a couple months ago, I was uh, at lunch at school with some friends, and my buddy Costa, he uh, said he liked the album title because it was modest, because what is Sounds and Words? It's just music. It's just music. This album isn't anything other than music. I'm not trying to be flashy here. I'm just trying to provide some good tunes, and that's really it. Um, so this is a kind of a interesting track overall because like it does kind of get big towards the end in a kind of unexpected fashion it's one of the couple songs that has gang vocals on the album um so every singer is on this track you got zach kathy lizzie aaron kylan uh, nick and tiffany on this um song in terms of the uh, the vocals for it a lot of you know just a lot of voices in this one but zach's taking the lead on this one i thought he had a very good like rough tone that kind of fit the folk rock vibe of the song um and then garrett uh the other garrett in my life gert as i'm gonna call him because i want to <laughs> um he took care of the uh nylon classical guitar solo of the song um so this song overall is a uh, I think it definitely uh, does, um, you know, ring true to the title, obviously, since it's in the song, because this is the one song on here that's really about music uh, overall, just the fact that it's still alive and it's still a thing and it isn't going to be dying anytime soon. The fact that there's so many different genres that exist, how can anybody think that one genre is really dead? How can anybody think that music as a whole isn't selling anymore? It is. The fact that, you know, vinyl is increasing, the vinyl boom. People are caring about music. It, it, it's, it's everywhere. It's ubiquitous. How are people acting like it's just gone? Um, so I wanted to, you know, prove that, like, you know, there's so many different things to offer where I name drop certain genres like free jazz, dream pop, black gays, soul. Um, IDM, pop, just so many different things that are in the world. It's it's like I, I don't I don't get how people just don't you know think that there's not a lot to offer in the world of music now. Um, and it wasn't like this originally. Back when I wrote the song, I had like super limited music taste. I knew like 
seven bands, really. At least in seven bands' full discographies and all. So I didn't have that much of uh, an education. So when I wrote the original lyrics, they were kind of just about rock. But why would I call the song Music Ain't Dying? Music Ain't Dying if I'm just talking about one genre. It didn't make a lot of sense. And I thought they were just kind of dumb at the end of the day. So I changed everything and I kind of made it a bit more personal um, to, you know, my uh, my growing music taste. You know, it's something that I kind of had to face the beginning of like 2017 or so. And I was just like, wait, if I'm going to enter the music industry, I need to know certain things. And so that just led me down the road of listening to stuff all the time, consuming new artists, consuming new albums, consuming consuming new genres, just becoming a different person, a more educated person, somebody who could just know things really. And I found that that's just the best thing for me personally to do is just keep hearing things. So if there's anybody to talk about how music isn't dying, it's me you know i don't know everything i don't claim to there's still so many worlds i need to explore um and i will never hear everything i have to accept that as somebody who knows that there is so much music going on in the world and so many artists and so so much things i'll just never hear and that's fine um but i wanted to really you know shine a light on just how creative the world is and I figure the, uh, having like, you know, the gang vocals as like the kind of hook of the song is like a unity kind of thing. It's like everybody's gathering together to prove that this art form isn't dying and how it gets all big in the end. It's just like, here's my big statement on, you know, what's really going on here. Um, definitely one of my favorite songs off of this album. I can say that for nearly every one, obviously, since I created it, but... I do think this is a very, um, just a very cool track to have here that's, you know, shining a light on a certain thing that people take very passionately and something that everybody hears pretty much every day and that there's just so much more to offer in the world. And that transitions directly into Time Off, which is a track that I don't consider to be as serious as Music Ain't Dying. Um, I think of the song as one of the more fun ones overall. Uh, as you can hear Zach, he's also taking the vocals for this track. Um, uh, Tristan Inman is on bass for this one. It just kind of, you know, the song is, uh, overall more on the pop punk side. I think it has a bit of skate punk in there as well. I don't think I was influenced by anybody in particular when creating the song, but I can definitely gather some, like, Green Day, like, Offspring kind of crossover sort of things, like, very very 90s in tone. Um, it's one of the faster songs on here. One of the more fun ones, I think. It's a nice breather moment, in a sense, since a lot of the songs on here do kind of deal with a bit more serious topics. Um, this one in particular just deals with a road trip. You know, people who uh, are just tired as hell of their work they're just they're done they don't want to do anymore so they just after they're done they just drive they don't know where they're going they just drive away it's kind of like uh an escapism anthem in a sense just going and going and going without knowing where they are going to end up and that's kind of the you know the carefree vibe of this one overall i think is very in very cool uh, features a very cool organ solo performed by Nick uh, something that I thought was just super cool for the song because you would never expect a pop punk song to have an organ an actual Hammond organ on it but it does and it sounds absolutely fucking awesome so that's the kind of you know interesting thing about just the album overall that I, I uh, bring in certain elements to it that you might not expect. Not to say that I'm doing anything totally genius or anything like that. It's just a kind of new thing. Um, and this song overall is, you know, I think it's, it's, it's a standout in that it doesn't take itself as seriously as some of the other tracks. I kind of like that I have 
songs on here that are a bit more serious in tone. I think most of this album is more serious in tone than less serious, but that you have a song like this that is just very carefree and very readily enjoyable. Um, uh, didn't also mention that uh, Tucker uh, is taking care of the guitar on this track, uh, the uh, lead guitar at the end of the song, because I can't really do solos very well, so I had to have other people do solos for me. And um, just a very nice, simple solo that ends off the song, and uh, that's that's time off. It's just a very fun, very quick, very energetic, very energetic song, very carefree. This was a fun one to to, to deal with the. Uh, the one with all the Beatles titles, I, I used to call it, um, as a shorthand, but, yeah, if you're kind of wondering why the song is like this the way it is, I, uh, I thought that the music sounded very Beatles-y in tones, so I was just kind of like, when coming up with the lyrics, I was like, uh, what would happen if I just combined a bunch of Beatles song titles together? And that's how this song was created, because a lot of the Beatles song titles... You can kind of put them together and just make like a relationship story out of it. And that's what I did with it. Because this, you know, the song details just a relationship. Again, kind of a song that I don't deem as serious in tone since the relationship in question is a bit more carefree. And more just, you know, a bit rebellious in a sense, I guess. Um, <laughs> I thought it was just a very fun thing I don't think I've ever heard anybody else just put a lot of song titles together and have that be uh, the basis for lyrics but if it works it works so I, I, I think that, I think it did for this and that's really why I thought it was just such a funny idea and then the song title which doesn't have anything to do with the song topic just combining a bunch of those Beatles titles where they're just names and just kind of having that be the basis for the title. I wanted to do a little bit um, a little bit more with the production of the song so that's why you hear all the different pan, you know, different like panning and all to kind of emulate that 60s stereo kind of sound, you know, especially if you, if you listen to you know, an album like Rubber Soul or like Revolver you can hear the different um areas where like you know some of the vocals may appear like on the left side on the left channel the drums are always you know at a certain spot it's just kind of like an interesting thing that the 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 60s artists they did and that's just you know kind of how the the sound was created so i wanted to try to do that for this song in particular um nick's on vocals for this one he, him and i are the only two people who are on this song he also plays bass on it as well and he had a field day with this song because it's just such a fun and kind of stupid like idea just putting all these uh, <laughs> song titles together that just somehow come together super well because uh, he's a you know big Beatles fan so it's just like the stupidest thing and we just really had a good time with um, just you know taking everything all together and just making it somehow work that's the funny thing about this song just i think how well it works and i know i'm complimenting my own work but how this song kind of just um you know comes together and how is it just you know again kind of like one of the less serious moments on here how you can have moments like this coexist with everything else and of course how it ends with the end how uh how clever of me until I decided to actually end it with ear rape. How funny. So now we have the, uh, I don't know if I would say the centerpiece of the album, but the song that I think closes out the first half of the album, uh, that being Bright White Light. Easily one of the two most serious and heavy 
songs on here and heavy and topic, not heavy in, you know, musical tone. Um, also the longest song on this album at eight and a half minutes. Uh, this is a song that, you know, I, I just kind of was screwing around with the finger style chord progression. And like I said, a lot of these songs, they just, um, came from me coming up with the chord progression and just kind of expanding on that. So that's no different for this one. Uh, the song overall, this might sound a bit pretentious, but I do sort of think of it like my stairway to heaven and in that it's, it's, it's long. It has a bit more of a folk rock, progressive rock kind of thing going on that stairway does. And the fact that the full band doesn't come in until about three minutes Stairway does it for four minutes, but still, you know, it's just it takes a while for the band to come in. Um, this is, I think, one of my, like, two favorite songs overall on here because of just how big the song is in tone overall, just how epic it seems. So I, I take care of all the guitar on this one. This one was pretty hard to do the finger style stuff. It was just, just not something that I found myself, um, super skilled at doing, but I got the job done. Like that's, that's great. <laughs> uh, Steven Evans is on bass for this one. Gert does the, uh, bongos on the track. Uh, Andrew Wodrak does the, the keyboards. He came up with a really awesome, really awesome piano part for the song that I just, I think adds so much color to, the uh, track overall, and I think the big standout on this track is um, is Kathy, the vocalist, who I, um, I put on the song because I think her voice is very, very thick, very round. Um, I, th I think her vocals on this song are one of the more imperfect, and that's not to say that she's like totally off pitch or anything. I would have noticed since I have perfect pitch. If she was way off, I would have, you know, had her re-record all the stuff. And this song did take a while for her to, like, get fully down. But I think that's because the song is very slow overall, so it's just a lot of held-out notes. A lot of different notes and syllables kind of going on. And the fact that she's... I think she works a bit better in a higher range, or she is mostly trained in there. So doing this song that's in a bit of a mid-range was a little bit of a challenge. But she pulled through, because I think the song came through incredibly um in the end it does sound a bit shaky at times but i genuinely don't mind it especially since the lyrical content of the song can kind of back some of that stuff up a little bit um i would say that you know she's definitely one of my favorite people i recorded with just because it was like very uh just because I think, you know, it took so long that she just uh, felt more determined to just get it down really well. And yeah, sure, it did take a while. But if it had taken such a short amount of time, then it, the end product wouldn't have been as good. So the fact that, you know, she was patient with me as I just like said, do it again and do it again and do it again and do it again was just it was really um, uh, something that I just appreciated a lot. And so the lyrical content of the song is one of the more serious and then it deals with death. It deals with the woman on her deathbed who is talking to her family for the last time. Just kind of saying her last goodbyes. Saying, enjoy life. I'm okay with dying at this point. I've lived a full life. Sure, I've done things that I may have regretted. Sure, I have haven't done things. But that's okay at the end of the day. It's just your life. You know, you're not going to be able to do everything and everything just kind of coming full circle and just realizing that you're a person at the end of the day and that you can just um you know you can you can be happy with what you did because everything happens for a reason even if something seems super terrible in the moment seems like you're in just a shitty mood everything can just you know, it happens for a reason if, if, if it if it leads to better things then sometimes it may be worth it you know that's just kind of a good life lesson overall for just, you know, living life, not necessarily in the context of the song, just um, understanding that in your final moments, you're probably going to be thinking about 
just, you know, um, everything. Just everything that you did in your life. Everything that is going on. Um, and I think, you know, the whole idea of, I mentioned, you know, the fact that the vocals kind of did sound a bit shaky at times. I don't think that's a bad thing since at your, in your final hours, are you really going to be, you know, the most eloquent you've ever been? Probably not. Are you going to sound the absolute best you've ever been? Probably not. You know, not to say that I wanted the vocals to sound awful on purpose. They, they don't even sound awful any, anyway. But I think that's kind of the interesting thing about just the way they sound overall and, you know, how they were for, how, how they were uh, performed and executed and all. So I was very happy with the way that um, Kathy ended up doing it. And I just, uh, I think it's one of the, one of the standout performances on the entire thing. Um, I had a lot of fun with the, you know, musical creation of this one. The whole orchestra section uh, was super fun to deal with because it was just me adding a ton of shit. It was just like, oh, wait, okay, I got horns, okay, organ, okay, strings, okay, next thing and next thing and next thing. It was just me adding so much stuff together. I had such a fun time creating that, and you know how the song progresses from getting more uh, big in tone to, you know, just kind of quieting down again and just how the song overall just uh, exists. I think this is a very progressive song because it's super long and super drawn out. Um, there's a lot to its sections. How it starts off very quiet and serene. And how it gets a little bit bigger. How it goes into the orchestra. How the final moments are just heavy in tone uh you know much louder much more rock and then how it just ends with the nice acoustic outro and um how everything overall just kind of comes together i think this is one of the tracks that i'm the most proud of on here because of the fact that it is really one of the more epic moments um I don't want to overuse that word because then it just kind of seems like I'm using it as a hype word. Uh, but I do think that this song is, since it's eight and a half minutes, it is kind of by nature an epic and that it's really slow. Um, so yeah, def definitely one of my favorite tracks on here that I wrote. One of the ones that I'm the most proud of. And, uh, you know, just how it, you know, all comes together and how it ends with the final breath. Of, of, of the woman that's just uh you know the the, the dying breath a very um fitting way to i think end the song and the first half fading out and all we start out the second half of the album with the song black hat in the play which i think carries on the same progressive tone of bright white light, but in a in a slightly different manner, one that isn't as overtly sad. Uh, this is a song here that this was actually the last song to be written for the album because I had come up with the, an interesting tuning for acoustic guitar, that being B F sharp, B F sharp, B F sharp. It's a B five power chord tuning. Went into that tuning and then just made the chord progression and all, and, and the song just wrote itself after that. And that's that's how this song was created. I thought it was so good that I just decided to slap it onto the track list. And so I'm very happy this this one ended up being one of the final moments, or not one of the final moments, but one of the songs that ended up making the cut, you know, because then it meant for me that taking the time to write it after thinking that I was done for a while was worth it. Musically, it, it, it's a bit more theatrical in tone, a bit more symphonic. Uh, you have Andrew also on the song doing a fantastic piano part. Strings to the song are a really nice touch. Um, you know, he's kind of he was just kind of like sending videos back to me. I'm just like, hey, is this what you want for this? And I'm like, hell yeah, dude, this is awesome. This is like the coolest thing to just add on top of this. I was super happy with... Uh, how that came through. Uh, we also have Tristan on bass, uh, and Kylan is on vocals for the song. Funny, the, the, the four of us were in a band together called Crass Contempt 
that Zach was actually the leader of. This was his solo project thing that he was telling me about that made me want to do my own thing, like his kind of solo band where he, you know, brought in most of his ideas. But he's not on the song, so this is four-fifths of Crass Contempt, which is really funny that uh, it kind of ended up being that way. I should have maybe had him on, like, you know, uh, just something so that we, we could make this full Crass Contempt song, but that just kind of ended up not being the case. Um, yeah, this song uh, is... Uh, Lyrically, one of the more interesting ones. This is one of the songs that I came up with from one line of the song. I think it was, how many lives have you taken away? I think that was the line that I came up with. And from that, I crafted the story that centers around a father whose daughter's missing. He turns on the news and he sees that her daughter is uh, his daughter is the prime suspect in the murder of her friends. He remembers one specific night where um, she came home. There was a red stain on her shirt. She passes off as ketchup and he thinks to himself, just, just from that alone, oh, she might have done this. So he goes to look for her and he eventually finds her and sees that she has killed herself. Guess knowing that she was going to get caught for the murder. So she just decided to end it all. And in a bit of a fucked up ending, um, he kind of knows that she did it, but he wants, you know, she's still his daughter. He wants to remain with her. So he ends up killing himself as well to put him and her in the same place together. I guess you could say that that means he believes in heaven and, uh, you know, so that way they will be together forever simply because of the fact that she's his daughter. Doesn't really matter to him in that moment that he knows that she committed a crime. It's just that, you know, he's going to be, he's going to be there with her. Um, it is a very, very, uh, interesting story. And one that I think I could have only come up with just from that one line. I don't think this is a story that I could have at all come up with, um, on my own. That's the kind of funny thing about writing, writing songs and writing lyrics you just come up with things from just one line you know that's kind of how it happens uh, I think some of the other songs on here are like that but maybe not maybe not all of them uh, but this is another I, I, I think stand out to me in just you know the lyrical tone alone is just very very interesting the story overall kind of adds to the progressive nature I think the song holds um just a very, uh, again, very epic song and tone. And I know, I know I use that term a lot, but it just kind of hits home to me in a in a big way. And I think, you know, Kylan's vocals overall are very, very emotive, especially with all the vibrato that he does on his voice and just the, the, the vocal tone overall and just how the song sounds with, like, you know, with slow registers and all that. It's just super, super cool and definitely one of my... Uh, favorites on here. And if you thought that, you know, those previous two tracks were like the big ones on here, then uh, I would say, you know, they are big ones, but I think of We're All Human as the big one on here because this one is one of the largest just in tone overall. Um, maybe not as directly progressive as the other two. I think this one is kind of more... A bit more alternative rock in tone, I guess. Um, and this is one that has multiple different vocalists on it in the same way that Music Ain't Dying does, but this one has multiple different lead vocals. Uh, the lyrics of the song, I think, are the most central to any song. It is an anti-discrimination song. Every verse details a point of view from somebody in the United States who has a bit of a reputation for being discriminated against in certain areas of the country, 
So Aaron Marquis Watson, he sings the first verse of the song um, from the point of view of a black person in Mississippi, because Mississippi has a pretty racist history. And it's not like they've gotten super better nowadays. They're still known for that. So just kind of like, you know, uh, just him being harassed and him questioning, like, what the, what's this for? Like, this is, I'm, I'm just the black dude. Like, what is, how do you come up with this? And the second verse uh, that Kylan sings, sung from the point of view of a gay person, who, same thing. I had to use, like, visual stereotypes for this, even though, obviously, you know, a man holding shopping mall bags in his hand and having nice clothes doesn't mean he's gay, but I had to use it for this, you know, just description overall just made the most sense, I think, overall, just to, to you know, depict this kind of discrimination same thing just like what's what's going on why because of something i can't control i don't get it and it's kind of the, just just the confusion of it or over, over overall how people can think this uh the choruses are just you know a bit more um unifying in tone i have nick sing the first one um and it's just kind of like hey we're all human here so why focus on the little things Do, they just do, doesn't matter at all like, it doesn't. I'm just a person. Deal with me for who I am, whether I'm, you know, black or gay or, you know, trans or whatever. It doesn't really matter. Just deal with me for who I am. I can't really change this. Um, the third verse, from the point of view of a woman in New York who's, you know, getting catcalled. Now, I, I don't know how frequent of a thing catcalling is in New York, but I imagine it's somewhat popular. I, I had a uh, Lizzie sing this one and I think she was one of my favorite people to record with just because of how like again determined and serious she was when recording I thought she had like a good growth from her first takes which weren't sounding super confident were sounding kind of quiet but then when she when she found everything you know she found her confidence it just made this so much better um I, I think it's interesting that her voice on that part is a little like modest and meek kind of like you know how a woman getting catcalled might feel might make them feel powerless in a sense not to say that they can't fight back but just the feeling overall i thought was portrayed very well um i had tiffany sing the uh um second chorus of this you know again i didn't really have any specific reason for having those two vocalists sing the chorus uh, you know the first and second chorus just because i wanted them to really um same thing overall it's just like it's 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 just you know unifying it's just hey don't focus on the little things that don't matter just you know focus on me as a person judge me for how i act and all that's really the main things that you should want a person to be judged for not based off of how they look or anything like that and the last two minutes of the song are my favorite just this ripping guitar solo from zach um, it's just, just incredible. I wanted the first half to be shreddy, and he came up with something so shreddy. I just loved it. I loved it. It was awesome. And then, the guitar mini. Oh, the guitar mini is, is just so, so big, and just so, so huge. One of my favorite moments on the entire album. How everything kind of drops out and then just, you know, comes back in to lead into the last chorus and the last chorus if I didn't think that there was more that I could do this is where all the stops come in every vocalist on here every vocalist is singing it and it's just the biggest thing where it's just like this is the big unifying moment everybody let's come together to just say we're all human it kind of again like just trying to talk about it it does leave me speechless which i know is maybe a bit of a weird thing since it's my song that i created so why am i getting this speechless over it but i mean i i am really proud of this one song in particular and just how it came out because everybody sounds incredible on it and how they came together it just it just fit my vision that i had for so many years and the fact that it's finally here and just how the song you know goes soft in the end it's kind of you know, does does that um, easily, easily one of my top favorites on this thing. 
um, just an incredible, just incredible, like, uh, big statement, I think. Then we get Rectalumba 4, which is, um, one of the more, you know, ballad moments on here. I didn't mention that Nick played the bass on, um, We're All Human, but yeah, he, he added a really groovy bass track for that that I dug a lot. Um... He performs the lead vocals on this track and also the keys. He did a, did a really great keys part. He's he's more of a, a keyboardist and a vocalist than a bassist, so I wanted to give him some time to shine in both areas. Um, the keys track here is very, very emotive. Um, the song overall, kind of similar to... I think this is kind of like a mini version of Bright White Light with how it starts off for its first verse and chorus. Just bare bones. Uh, then it gets, you know, gains a little bit more instrumentation, gets big at the end. I think it does kind of, kind of end up being a bit of a predictive formula by the end, but it's one that I think works, so I don't really have any problems with uh, repeating that formula. If it, if it works, why not keep doing it if it just works? Lyrically, this is a... I, I, you know, I mentioned Bright White Light in comparison to the song, but this is the other song on the album that deals with death. It de details a man and, uh, a, you know, a husband and wife whose marriage is falling apart due to the husband's alcoholism. And it's New Year's Eve, so they want to be happy together. But his wife is out doing... Don't tell her no what, just something. And she gets in a car crash and dies. So I had, uh, you know, Nick do the lead vocals of the song. Aaron uh, performs the part of the cop that calls, um, you know, Nick's character and tells him the news that his wife has passed on. So he begins to drink out of just pure confusion and he really wants to better himself and this is going to be the last time that he uh, decides to drink. You know, I don't follow this character after the song ends but you kind of hope in the end of the day at the end of the day that he tries to better himself and tries to just uh not go down the dark roots of alcoholism anymore because that can really screw up your relationships you know not to say that this you know of course, not to say that his wife would have lived had he never had a sip of alcohol. It probably would have still happened that she would have gotten in a car crash, but um, sometimes the darkest events in your life can force you to, uh, you know, give up something. I'm not saying that they should obviously happen so that way he would have to not be an alcoholic anymore, but again kind of like i said everything does happen for a reason so even if it's terrible it's not okay but it can be the catalyst for something um a bit more positive at the end of the day which is a it's just the it's just it's just a harsh reality of life type of thing where the worst things can lead to something else whether that's better or worse is all up to the people around to make their decisions at all so i think this song is a you know one of the more serious in tone obviously given the fact that the music is super low-key that everything just kind of comes together in a very very emotional package much, much in the same that bright white light does this song is just you know the other song about death on here and how slow the song is, how somber the tone is overall. Um, it's just a very uh, a very interesting one overall, I think. And one that I I think I actually came up with, again, from one line. It was a line that didn't end up making the song. I think I came up with the line, like, another place, another face. And for, for somehow, I, I think I came up with a story based off of that, but that line... And the first chorus I had originally for the song, this chorus had to be reworked because uh, it just wasn't really amazing in the first place. That's kind of how it, um, kind of the story came along. And originally I was going to have the song, um, 
not be resolved on the the last A flat chord of the song, but then Nick was doing the keys for it and he was like, I just want to do this and like, you know, resolve to the last chord. And I was like, that's even better. So sometimes it's like in studio things can just like affect things. And that's how that song came about. And I just love it even more. I still chuckle at that every time I, uh, every time I hear it, because it's just so, so stupid. So, um, this one is the encore. This one is, is, uh, you know, kind of like how Time Off is very pop punk. This one is very pop punk as well. This one is pure Green Day worship in my eyes. Um, so I had, you know, Tiff sing this one because she's a huge Green Day fan. So she could channel her inner Billy Joe Armstrong. And it kind of worked. Um, this song overall, like, like, like and, and, and the, uh, <laughs> the little thing at the beginning, the if oh most were a cat, that's my voice. That's my voice. Uh, one of the only times my voice appears on this album. And we were just kind of screwing around, you know, having our banter like we usually do in the studio. And she actually did, you know, a meow that was more like Owen Wilson's wow. But we just ended up not liking that one as much, so we just went with our regular meow. So that's why it's it's there. And I wanted to put it in here somewhere because this is the song that she's on. And the fact that the song is a bit more carefree in tone, it was just like, you know, I thought it was a funny idea to put it at the beginning and to just be like, wait, what the hell is going on? And it just kind of come up with the, you know, <laughs> just start off with something funny and then just have everything just like blare in so suddenly. I, I love things, things like that that just kind of shock you. Um, and lyrically, this is one about a band who's just super tired after a show, but they gotta play the encore for the crowd because they're asking for it. You know, that's kind of the thing that bands do. They just play more songs. That's, um, you know, that's kind of the whole basis around the song. One of the first songs to be written for the album, I actually came up with this one on piano. I was just, you know, screwing around with some power chords and came up with this one. And then eventually it just, you know, blossomed into the, um, the pop punk anthem that it is. So I have um, also on the song uh, Stevens on bass and Tucker's on the lead guitar for this track because pop punk is in is totally in his lane. So I was like, yo, do some pop punk leads and he did some pop punk leads and they're awesome pop punk leads. <laughs> and it's just thought it was a very, um, you know, very fun, you know, just very, very fun overall, like solo kind of thing. Um, so yeah, this is not one that I think it's like a super deep song or anything like that it's a really good you know again breather moment because you know the previous few songs were very serious in tone so i like having these uh fun moments in here and then you got this like acapella thing going on i don't know how i came up with this but i thought it was just like the coolest thing to have in a song like this where it just drops out and you're like what the what, what the, the, don't, what the oh my god that's that's i don't really think that's how anybody would react to that they would probably just like stare in silence or something like that but uh kind of just like how uh you know the how everything kind of comes together uh just hearing that part and it's just like the coolest the coolest thing um so i i like how uh this song kind of gave them together it kind of I, I think this is one of the songs that represents my high school taste the best because i was a huge green day fan i don't think a lot of these other songs represent my you know, taste in high school very well because they're just kind of a little bit, bit, more, bit more sophisticated. Um, but yeah, this one's just a very, very fun pop punk tune. And then we end the album with the song Fellowship. Probably the most personal on the album. It is a, a you know, acoustic ballad. I think this is kind of like, um, you know, an indie folk song, kind of like in the vein of like an Elliot Smith who I didn't know who the hell he was in high school. Other than maybe like say yes, I guess. But um, it's funny that I kind of ended up writing a song like in the vein of him if I didn't really know as much of his stuff. Just kind of proves that like this album kind of ended up being very diverse accidentally. So I had, uh, you know, I, I'm doing the guitar on this track, which holy shit, this was hard to do because the arpeggios are tough. So I came up with, the, you know, that uh, kind of riff that you hear. And I have Zach doing the vocals on the song. This was a song that we were originally going to do with Verse Ecology, the band that we were in. 
We have recorded a demo with it that sounds absolutely terrible. It's on SoundCloud, clips all the way through. So that doesn't sound very good overall. Um, this is just a much better version of it. I wish we had double tracked the vocals though. I think that would have been a bit better if we did that, but I don't really mind the barren way that they sound right now. Um, so this song is about a um, high school retreat that I went on called Kairos, where it's basically like a four day retreat where you're like in groups and you just um you kind of just get to know each other a little bit more through certain group activities and many different things happen over the course of these four days that you know you can't tell anybody about unless they've been on the trip it's a highly secretive thing um so i want to spoil any of that you know right now, I, I went to Notre Dame High School, uh, so, you know, th th that's uh, where, you know, this uh, you know, song is kind of coming from. Um, so if anybody from Notre Dame hears this, make this the Kairos Anthem. Just do it. Just do it. So I had a very good time at it, so I decided to write a song about it because I felt like it was just, like, the best thing to do. Um, and I kind of wrote it about, you know... Just the retreat overall, how I kind of found a bit more of myself through it. I think it's fun, kind of interesting that the album is bookended by songs about finding certain selves. Let My Spirit Out is about finding oneself after trying to overcome their own shyness. And the song, you know, it wasn't like Kairos absolutely changed me as a person or anything like that. It's a religious retreat from a religious school. And I was an atheist before that. I'm an atheist now. I wasn't, it's not like, you know, I, I, I changed you know, and found God or anything like that, but I did gain friendships. I did realize just, you know, the, the, um, how certain people can come off maybe different from how they actually are deep inside. And it's kind of, the, you know, the thing about a retreat like that, you just kind of air everything out. There's no filter, really. Anything is welcome. And it was a great time with my group and kind of makes you just want to go back and relive it again and just relive all the nostalgia of dealing with these activities for the first time. And it's kind of what I hope this song, you know, uh, kind of incites in some people. I think it's a very nice way to end the album very softly, very acoustic, not a bombastic statement or anything like that. Just a very sweet, just a very personal song. One that, uh, I, I, I have a personal attachment to, I have a very strong attachment to, and I think was the perfect way to end this off. I don't think there's any other song that could have closed this album out. I was never going to ever think about closing this album out with any other song. This, this was it. This was it. And that's it. That is the album, um, Sounds and Words, that I just provided my own commentary for. Um, I hope that by doing this, you all who, if you all stuck around for all that, uh, I very strongly appreciate it. Um, hope it, you know, gained a little bit of insight into how all these songs were made, how they were created, and, you know, the lyrical content behind everything, and just you know, what these songs mean to me, they mean pretty much the world to me at this moment. I don't know if I'll ever hold any other album I make um, in comparison to this one or, like, more than this one. I feel like after having this in my brain for so long and having it finally be released that the catharsis of that alone is just enough to make this like one of my proudest statements. But I, I, I think I will forever be indebted to, um, you know, this, this record right here and just how all these songs came about, how I ended up with the final version, how it ended up being recorded, how it came out, how I got a grade on it, how it just uh, kind of represents a chapter of my life in a way, even though I don't think this album is about me. It's not. It's just my songs. So 
I hope that uh one I I I I hope that people, you know, genuinely enjoy the project if, you know, uh I'm somebody who is no stranger to giving, you know, things feedback. I don't mind saying, "Hey, I don't really like this" or "Hey, I really do like this" and giving my reasons as to why. So I'm of course not expecting every person to latch onto this album like it's god or anything. They may not even think it's great, but that's that's totally fine cuz I'm no stranger to believing in the subjectivity of people. You know, just like music is is, is an art form. Nobody should dictate your opinion. Sure, it helps that, you know, some albums and, and some artists are super acclaimed and that you may uh, see why based off all that acclaim, but it's not like you have to... It's not like you have to agree with them. And I'm just grateful for people who do find something in this uh, and grateful for anybody who chooses to listen to it just out of curiosity or, you know, whatever. I... I, I I appreciate that the most. Uh, so I uh, I released this as a free download because I didn't know how to make sure that the people who were on it got a fair share of revenue out of it because I'm not really sure how it works if I like, oh, I don't know, give them like some money up front and then I can put it online and I would get all the sales from it because I feel like that's just a bit odd so I didn't want to do anything with that at least right away and since this is so DIY so independent it would have been a hassle to deal with all that stuff that's not to say that this you know won't ever end up um, being released you know for for you know profit it might one day but I, 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 I want to do it in I guess the right way in a way that I feel comfortable with and if it never ends up getting released for money, then oh well. That's just kind of um, that's just kind of the way it is, you know. I, I I don't mind if that's the case either. It just kind of depends on the on the situations that I find myself in and the ones that I hold. Um, so don't really think there's much more I have to say regarding um, uh, regarding this album. Uh, for anybody who again decided to listen to it i thank you very much for taking your time to just you know take it in for everybody who was on it i you mean the world to me um and i appreciate your time and effort into executing these parts to the best of your ability and i wish the best for all of you i hope to work with uh some of you again and I uh, thank you for you know deciding to listen to this commentary if you genuinely felt interested to do it because you know I, 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 I like you know seeing where people kind of come from uh, when they um, decide to make music. So you know the fact that I could uh, you know do the same thing for myself and just kind of air my own thoughts out is just something that I wanted to do. So, um, I think I'm going to end it there. Um, again, my name is Garrett Manioki. I, uh, I pretty much am Blackboard to a degree, but Blackboard is the name of the project. It's not an alter ego. It's not an alias. You know, uh, it's just the name of the project overall. I will be continuing to make uh, solo music under this name. Um, let's kind of see where that takes me in the future. Uh, you can uh, listen to Sounds and Words on Bandcamp and YouTube. Those are the only two places at the moment that I have it uh, to be heard. So, um, again, I, I, I know I've said this a lot, but thank you to everybody who stuck through this commentary. Thank you to everybody who listened to the album. Thank you to everybody who appeared on it. Uh, just overall, a big thank you to everybody. And... Um, I hope you overall enjoy and uh, hope that you all have a good day. Thank you very much.